Hi there. Welcome, everybody. Um, I am going to give folks a couple more minutes to all join. But as you are streaming in, um, definitely drop into the chat where you're dialing in from today. And also, if you're feeling ambitious, um, drop in what aspect based off of your understanding of V3 you're most excited about. Um, that's something our panelists will also be describing, but would love to hear from all of you um, what, what part of the new standard um, is getting you extra pumped. Um, and I am going to share my screen. Perfect. Um, panelists, can you give me a thumbs up that you can see the screen? Perfect. Thank you. Great. So it looks like folks are streaming in. I'm going to give just one more minute before we before we get going. Um, thanks, John, joining from Washington, D.C. We've got California. And great. Um, this today's session should get everyone up to date on the on the new standard and all the ins and outs from sort of a variety and range of perspectives. We've got Canada, Wales, wow, that is exciting. Michigan, Kansas City, we've got sort of across the, across the US here. Perfect. So I am going to get us started to be sensitive to everyone's schedules. We always try to keep these kind of as tight as possible. We know everybody has busy days. Um, but uh, just to kick us off, um, my name is Sarah Carrera, and I'm the Managing Director of the Center for Active Design, the operator of the FitWell standard. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's conversations with some of our experts from across the FitWell team, um, and we will be digging into the V3 standard. I know we've had several webinars on this topic, but today's goal is really to walk you through the process of the development of the standard and then show you um, a demo of the platform so you can see how all of this work got us to the place we are at today and see what the actual experience is going to be in using the v3 standard um so it will really be just going um from start to finish of what that whole um road mapping process looks like um and today we have as i mentioned experts from across the fitwell team joining us today. And so I am going to stop sharing my screen so you can see everyone's lovely faces. Um, and I, um, before I jump into the agenda, um, would love to, uh, if everybody on our team could introduce themselves. So starting with uh, Grace, if you could talk a little bit about yourself and then also what aspect of the V3 standard you're most excited about um, today. Sure. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Excited to be here. Uh, my name is Grace Dickinson. I'm the Associate Director of Applied Research uh, for the Center for Active Design. Uh, so our research team really provides the evidence base for all the strategies you see, you see in the standard, as well as leads other original research initiatives, something we're really picking up this year and moving forward to support the healthy building movement. Uh, my personal background is in urban planning and public health. So really at the nexus of what we do here. Uh, for me, the most exciting part of the V3 standard update, which we'll explore later in the webinar, is the new research and strategies we've added around climate change. So in the public health space, we've long acknowledged climate change as a public health issue, but really in the last year or so, especially in response to COP28, we're starting to see it acknowledged as a material issue across business, including in real estate. So I'm really excited to see that reflected in this update. Perfect. Thank you so much, Grace. And now moving forward, um, we're going to go down the order of how our process operates. Um, so moving next to uh, Rachel, who heads up our standard team, if you could um, also give a little bit of background about yourself. I know this audience is familiar with you um, and also the aspect of the V3 standard that you're most excited about. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm Rachel Seiko. I'm the director of standard development here at the Center for Active Design. Um, same as Grace, I have a background in both public health and urban planning, um, and so I use that in my work in the standard, which is grounded in more than a century of research connecting built environment interventions with health outcomes. So um, for those who don't know, the standard team is responsible for translating the research into those implementable strategies, um, which is how we work so closely with the research team um, and with our industry partners. Um, I'd say one of the things um, 
most excited, I'm most excited about in V3 will be some of the scorecard efficiencies we're introducing, including the system validation functions and, and the data input fields for strategy requirements. So um, these input fields and attestations and other enhancements will simplify the documentation process we're hoping. Um, and we'll, you know, we're really excited that these new upgrades and data input fields will also allow our users to get more robust data um, and track their progress over time. Awesome. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, definitely the part that I'm probably most excited about too, is that incremental, um, that motivation towards incremental progress. Um, so to wrap us up, um, as our process goes, I want to turn it over to uh, Karen to give a similar introduction and also uh, share share the aspect that she's most, most pumped about. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, I'm Karen Chen. Um, I'm head of digital product here um, at FeltWall. Um, so my team handles all of uh, building out of the digital experience that um, you guys all use to, 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 to certify your projects. Um, the thing that I'm most uh, excited about for, for V3 is um, all of the breakout of the requirements so that there are very explicit data fields that you can put in. Um, whereas before it was just a bunch of document uploads um, which means that now we have the um, ability to be able to um, create more value out of the information that you're providing us. So um, kind of similar to echoing what Rachel said, um, just a lot of opportunity for more um, exciting features to come. Great, thank you all. So um, I want to uh, start here when we, um, in talking about sort of the development of the um, V3 standard, um, it all sort of originated with um, the research and the evidence base. So understanding that there were areas that we wanted to kind of expand the scorecards into based off of the ever evolving public health evidence base. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Grace to speak a little bit about the, the reasoning behind um, this, this update. And I do, before I turn it over to Grace, want to mention that any questions that come up during um, our conversation, please put those into the Q&A. And we will have two different moments um, throughout today's session, um, right before the demo, sort of after our conversation, to talk through some of the like content questions that might be coming up. And then um, at the end, um, after Karen uh, shares the demo of the site and um, the, the platform, we will have time for questions about the platform itself. So with that, um, Grace, if you could dig in a little bit to the reasoning behind um, going about this huge uh, update. Yeah, great question, Sarah, uh, because a lot of the update really does start with the research. So it's been about five years since we updated the standard, and uh, research is really growing and evolving every day around new technologies, new interventions. So we knew we wanted to take a comprehensive look at the standard and ensure that it was reflecting the most up-to-date research. Uh, additionally, we wanted to ensure that our strategies not only include uh, research best practice, but also are accurate uh, to what is being implemented across the real estate industry, something that I know Rachel's going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, so with input from technical advisories and research advisories, we focus on emerging technologies and practices to, to better understand the evidence base for inclusion. Uh, so when a new technology emerges and evidence builds around the benefits of that technology for health, we're, we, we look at all of that evidence and really try to judge when it reaches a threshold of uh, having enough evidence to be included in the standard. Uh, finally, we also take a look at key emerging themes, which in this case, uh, in the time since our last update, really were equity and climate change. As I mentioned, these are two topics that have emerged as key public health issue issues over the past few years. So we wanted to make a conscious effort uh, in this update to address them. So you'll see that in strategies like our economically diverse housing strategy, increasing internet access initiatives, uh, those really focus on equity, to strategies around biodiversity and addressing developments in fire and flood prone zones, really central uh, climate change issues. You can take a deep dive into those themes in one of our latest uh, CFAD blog posts, which I think the, li the link will be dropped in the chat. That's a great way to check out some of the new themes that have come out of this V3 update. In our research process, we really consider the strength of evidence connecting the strategy intervention to the health impact. So how strongly the intervention, be it a design policy or construction intervention is connected to a health impact. 
the quality of evidence supporting the intervention. So uh, do we have meta-analyses? How big are these sample sizes? Is the positive impact observed across different settings, say North America, Europe, Asia, et cetera? And finally, the quantity of evidence under consideration. So how much has been published and established on this intervention? So all of those things really came in uh, to our process of updating the standard. Great. Thank you so much, Grace. And it's a really, really great point about the um, role that um, the kind of position we take when it comes to new technologies and really trying to dig deep into what um, does have evidence behind it, what might be emerging, and then um, we're not quite there yet when it comes to it being well proven. And really, anytime in society where there's a moment that folks rally around, whether it's COVID or climate change, um, there is this emergence in innovation and new technologies, and we really strive to be that trusted resource to help folks understand what um, technologies they can rely on um, and where there might be a need to be still be a little bit critical, skeptical, um, and see where the evidence goes over time, which is why we're kind of constantly working to, um, to review the literature that's out there. Um, so I do, I'm excited to um, turn it over to Rachel to talk a little bit about the kind of, because historically we have updated scorecard by scorecard, um, this really presented this um, huge opportunity for us to take a more holistic look at the standard. Um, so I wanna turn it over to Rachel to talk a little bit more about um, the structural changes and sort of how we approach the standard um, from that structural perspective. Sure, thanks, Sarah. Um, so as Grace mentioned, our last update was in 2018, so V3 was, really a huge undertaking. So kind of to echo what Sarah said, you know, taking a more holistic look at the standard as a whole. So as part of this thorough update, we meticulously reviewed the standards content, made sure that the language was clear, update applicability pathways. But um, in addition to those kind of general standard updates and all the updates um, to the research and the evidence, we wanted to expand the impact and applicability of FitWell and improve user experience and implementation overall. Um, and so one of the goals of this update was to make FitWell more scalable, more agile. Um, and so our team took a look at the standard and aligned all the strategies and requirements um, across scorecards where there were overlaps in the strategies um, to improve the consistency and clarity of the requirements and the compliance documentation. And we created a catalog of all the FitWell strategies across all the scorecards um, and so this catalog that we're calling the FitWell Strategy Library will help our users to streamline the implementation um, and recertification of strategies across their portfolios with diverse asset types um, for where there is strategy alignment. Um, and part of this was also uh, wanting to streamline the requirements and documentation. And as I mentioned earlier, um, one of the goals of that was to reduce submission errors and improve clarity and certification efficiency for our users. So you'll see that the compliance documentation is now paired directly with associated requirements. We're hoping that this will help our users know exactly what pieces of documentation are verifying each requirement um, and giving users a, a sort of checklist to ensure response to each requirement and kind of minimize some of those errors in the documentation process. Um, We've improved clarity for user response by creating those uh, compliance pathways that I know we've talked about in some of the previous um, webinars, um, but including multiple alternative compliance pathways and multiple full credit compliance pathways, which are distinctly separated as options now. Um, and then also on, on this update on the platform, you'll see um, expanded access enhancements to client response functions, as, as I mentioned earlier. Um, opportunities for performance assessments and, and benchmarking. So there'll be um, more of an interactive data-driven dashboard, um, those system validation functions and, and input fields that we mentioned, which are providing calculation and input fields for documentation directly on the platform. Um, and that'll help to validate ahead of time whether the project can qualify for the strategy, um, allowing your team to see if they qualify during submission. Um, and hopefully this will simplify the process and, and improve the, the submission time and, and save all of you um, time in gathering documentation and, and validation. So um, I would say also, you know, in addition to the new content and tech features, we've also tried to enhance and improve applicability for the users and expand its impact across asset types. So 
you'll see there's new multi-tenant building solutions um, that kind of expand the scorecard um, access for building owners and managers with those health promoting strategies to impact uh, the health of all the building occupants. And then um, lastly, just in terms of the, the tools and resources, we've created um, updates to all of those resources and tools, including change logs so you can see what's changed from V2.1 to V3, um, and those strategy lists, which can all be found on the Fitwell Help Center. Um, you know, in an effort to reduce some of the inconsistencies and ensure all our users have access to the most up-to-date content, we've sunset those offline reference guides and we'll be using the Help Center as the reference guide for our users. Um, this will also allow us to respond to user feedback and update content as needed and ensure that everyone has reference to the most accurate and up-to-date information. Um, but definitely check out that Help Center um, I believe we're going to drop a link in the, the chat there for those of you who don't know where it is. Um, but over time, we'll be building this out with more FAQ articles and additional guidance. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. So I think, um, as you all can probably tell from everything that Grace and Rachel have shared so far, there's a lot of thought that went into this standard update, a lot of thinking about not only the research, but also the user experience, how we can ensure that there is consistency for um, folks who are using the standard and see it from a variety of different perspectives. Um, so very exciting to see sort of all of that manifest in this in this update. And we haven't even gotten to the most exciting part, um, which is the um, the the platform itself. So um, I would love uh, to turn it over to Karen to um, she Karen. I realize you're going to dig in a little bit deeper into um, all the ins and outs of the platform via your demo. But just from a high level perspective, if you could share a little bit about your approach um, and the uh, kind of biggest, no most notable changes on the Fitwell platform that folks can expect. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um... So I hope most of you have seen our new platform at this point. I'll do a quick intro and then uh, dive deeper later on in um, in our webinar. But um, just to introduce um, that in the years since our platform has been out, um, we've gathered a lot of learnings about what worked, what didn't, both from um, us using and expanding within the platform, but also from the feedback that you have all provided us um, over time, which we're really grateful for. Um, so with that information, and knowing all of the areas and you know exciting features that we want to grow um, and build into, um, this was a great opportunity for us to rethink and create a new modern design, both from a visual perspective and also um, the behind the scenes tech that that power our platform, so that it opens up space for us to um, continue to scale and and provide more really exciting features. Um, I do want to note that one of our first key goals for this first launch was to make sure that we try to stick as close to the navigation as um, we could um, for the for for what you're familiar with, so that it wasn't like a very jarring experience to switch, and then continue to evolve over time. Um, so hopefully, for um, everyone who's used it so far, it's been a good experience. But keep the feedback coming because it's been really helpful in helping us continue to evolve and improve our platform. Awesome. Thank you. And I know we'll be doing another plug at the end um, for, for feedback because it really is so integral to our process. Um, I want to dig a little bit into sort of the, the iterative part of our process where um, the research team and the standard team really do collaborate to make sure not only that we're um, reflecting the research in a rigorous way, but also that what we're putting out there is applicable, makes sense for users, those who are actually the practitioners and the stewards of our built environment. Um, so I would love Grace and Rachel, if you guys could both speak a little bit about how you go about developing an updated standard, what that process looks like, what the back and forth, um, kind of manifests as, and maybe starting with Grace, since I know everything we do originates, originates with that research base, um, and then moving on to Rachel, who can share a bit about how we integrate the inner industry, um, perspective. If you guys could talk a little bit about that, what that, um, feedback loop looks like internally, that would be very, very helpful. Definitely. Uh, so I will talk a little bit about how our research process gets initiated. And as Sarah mentioned, it uh, is super iterative and interactive with Rachel and her team. Uh, but really, our research process gets initiated in one of two ways. 
Uh, the first way, typically, uh, typically it's an area of research we will be seeing from our side in the academic literature or in news we follow. And we been, begin to start combing our resources to better understand how a new initiative, be it a new technology, design intervention, uh, something of that nature, is, is connected to our health impact categories. If we find that an impact is significant, as I mentioned before, uh, this would mean that the evidence base is of substantial quantity, quality, and impact across at least one of our health impact categories. As you'll remember, every strategy in our standard has to have a significant impact in at least one health impact category. Our team will propose that the strategy gets included into the standard with the product team. Uh, if all of this stands, the product team will then draft a strategy for inclusion and determine the various asset types it's applicable to. Obviously, that process has a lot of steps in between but that, that Rachel will explore, but generally that is kind of how that works. Uh, the other way that our research process in standard development can be initiated is if clients or members of the technical advisory, which Rachel will talk about, bring to our attention an industry or technology best practice that we have yet to explore on the research side and isn't included in our standard. In that way, our team on the research side will then begin to audit peer-reviewed research for validating the evidence. Uh, so these are kind of the two ways that we decide to incorporate things into the standard. Um, I will add that in this V3 update, since it was so comprehensive, we actually also system systematically audited uh, all of the V2.1 strategies that you saw in our earlier standard to update and vet the research and ensure that they still stood the test of time. Uh, so things that were cited from sources, say, from two 2010, uh, we went through and made sure that there is a recent research update, uh, articles maybe from 2018, 2020, 2023, uh, that really helped to substantiate that this intervention is still standing the test of time uh, connecting to health. So uh, everything in V3, even strategies that are familiar to you, have been updated uh, in a from a research perspective, which is really exciting. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this entire update has been an iterative process. Everything that we do from the research side gets audited by the standard team, Rachel's team, and uh, through their process before it comes uh, into, into a standard. Um, so this has been kind of a, a long effort across many internal teams. So we're really excited to see the standard out, out in the world. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and Rachel, do you want to talk a little bit about this process from the standard perspective? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're continuously revisiting and updating the standard to make sure it's got the most up-to-date research and that's reflected in our strategies and requirements um, and to also test the applicability with the industry as Grace mentioned with um, our advisory. So when we work on a standard update or a new certification system, we seek advice from our technical advisory, we consult our research advisory, um, and we work with other key stakeholders, including our um, FitWell Leadership Advisory Board um, and other experienced FitWell users to evaluate and improve the standard. So um, the V3 update is truly a reflection of years of feedback um, since the last update that we had was five years ago. So um, just going to dig a little bit into how our, our industry um, is included in this process. So the purpose of the technical advisory is to connect with industry leaders who have extensive experience using FitWell um, to help advance the content and the applicability and strengthen our overall products. So um, through a series of meetings, surveys, and other types of outreach, um, our technical advisory members have opportunities to provide feedback and insight on um, different aspects of the FitWell system from strategy application to FitWell platform features. Um, and so all of these stakeholders really help us to ensure scorecards meet industry demands, um, help us to understand who our users are and how they're using FitWell, and to expand the impact of FitWell um, and ensure applicability of its, its implementation. So um, just a couple examples of, of how we listen to our, our industry users and understand how the strategies and requirements are being implemented um, to ensure that the strategies are technically sound. One example is um, based on feedback <clears throat> and a review from our research team, we um, decided to give full credit for projects that have fewer lactation rooms, but offer a full year of maternity leave. So 
This is something that used to be um, an alternative compliance pathway in B2.1, you got partial credit. Um, but after hearing a lot of pushback from the industry um, and seeing that this practice is becoming more popular, um, we know it's something that's uh, you know applied in a lot of other countries and has a more global applicability, but even here stateside. Um, so you know, our research team went back and looked at it kind of in that iterative process and everyone agreed that yes, in fact, it does have the same impact. So that's something we changed. Um, but, you know, some examples of what could happen if we we didn't connect with the industry to understand how these things are implemented in practice. So, um, you know, understanding we've been asked um, in scenarios with multiple buildings, if the lactation room could be in another building, you know, after going to the research team, they confirmed that these do need to be located in the building in order to be accessible and meet the intent. So those are things where we really do try to listen to our users and ultimately rely on the research, but try to balance that implementation. Um, and during the, the V3 update specifically, we also consulted technical experts on the development of some more technical um, policies and protocols um, to include global best practices for things like indoor air quality and water quality. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point, Rachel, about um, the effort to make this more globally applicable as well. Um, that's always something that we are are striving for and where our industry feedback is so helpful is understanding what those unique contextual um, applications look like. Um, there's no way for us to um, be in all places at all times. So really, um, we see our role as collecting that information, distilling it, and then putting that back into the standard out into the world. So Thank you, um, Rachel. Um, and I am going to actually hold on our conversation about the feedback process until the end. Um, but I do want to pause for um, any questions um, that we have for the audience. Please send those in. Um, and I will do my best to respond um, during the demo. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Karen to walk us through the updated platform and what that looks like from the user experience side. Thanks, Sarah. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, can everyone see or not see? Okay, we look good. All right. Um, okay, so I am now logged into um, our new redesigned platform. Um, so hopefully if you all had a chance to see it, but you have, if you haven't, I'll walk you through it right now. Um, for those of you who have multiple different accounts, you'll see it um, in the all accounts tab here um, to, to get to all of the accounts that you have access to. Once you select one, it'll bring you into the dashboard that you hopefully know and love. Um, there's also a help center link here. Um, I know this is a frequently asked question that we get in trying to find the, the help center link for to answer all your questions and getting all the resources. So if you click that, that'll take you directly to the help center. So you'll always have that pretty much bookmarked for you in the Fitwell platform. Um, jumping into the improvements that we've made in the um, in the overall UX itself, if you look at the dashboard, um, you'll see that there's the, um, the, the project status here. Um, we've also expanded this to include, to call out any projects that have expired since you've last certified. I know this is an area of interest for um, a lot of um, our users to figure out what they need to recertify. Um, um, and then we've also expanded upon the um, the benchmarking um, chart that we have below. So you'll see now that um, for all of your projects that are certified, you'll also be able to get a summary of the ranks, the rest of the industry that are certified at, at the specific um, asset type that's selected at the top here. And then you can also see how your different uh, projects fall within the uh, the different percentiles on the chart by hovering over a bit. Okay, um, jumping into um, still sticking on kind of existing uh, features and functionality that we've uh, we've built upon and improved. If I um, navigate to one of my projects um, here, um, you'll see a list of all of the projects that I have. Um, if I go into a specific project, You'll see the status um, markers are now more explicitly kind of what status you are. This one is expired. If I go into a different one, uh, for example, this one, I'll see that it's been certified at one star and it's still valid. 
um, once I navigate into the certification, um, the newest thing that we've introduced to the certification scorecards is the certification overview page here. Um, that just gives you a summary of how your um, certification is performing, what the what the score is, how many um, remaining strategies you need to complete. Um, and then the part that I'm most excited about is the certification timeline that we've now introduced. Um, so um, you'll notice that for all of your projects now, if you go in, you'll be able to see the milestones that you've completed along with um, the targeted due dates if, if it's been assigned. Um, so previously where you had to receive an email and reference it in the email and forward it onto your different team members, as long as um, the team has access to the certification here, they'll be able to see um, the, the timeline um, of the certification process along with the uh, projected or estimated dates that you need to have things completed by um, in order to get your certification. Okay. Um, moving up top here, um, you'll also find that um, once your project has at least completed the initial review um, and is moving on through the, the rest of the process, all of the certification reports are now um, consolidated here. Um, so you can go here to download your initial or final reviews. Um, we're also looking at building out additional review, uh, sorry, reports um, that um, will be useful to the team. So um, as those get built out, you'll see this, um, this piece expand. Um, and then last but not least, um, we've also kind of read it. Redesigned and made more beautiful the gap analysis that I know is a um, popular um, feature that uh, is used by our teams. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of you, I believe, print print these out um, for your clients or or for your team members to reference. So we we've made this more um, hopefully more visually appealing and also have more information on there to identify what projects you're printing it out for uh, um, that is being distributed to the teams. Okay, so these are all the features that are available across all of our scorecards, um, regardless of version. Um, so go ahead and go there and, and, and check them out. Um, what I'll do next is jump into our um, V3 scorecard, um, just to take a look at the new inputs and the new features there. So I've kicked off a new, sorry, let me find it, a new V3 project. I'm going in here. Um, again, similar project overview page um, version. I'll go ahead and click resume. And then once I'm in, also very similar certification overview, or it should be the same, um, gives you the field of score, status, how many strategies you have left to complete, um, the health impact categories that um, you've achieved based on the strategies that you've achieved, and then also an outline of the certification timeline to expect. Um, jumping into the scorecard, uh, initially it should look pretty similar to what you're used to for V2.1. Um, it gives you the, the strategy name and the subtitle. Um, the one difference is all the answers are initially limited to yes or no. Um, for those where the strategies are answered no, it's considered complete. Uh, but once you answer yes, um, you now have multiple different options that you can select from um, to try to meet the criteria uh, of the strategy. So in this case, as an example for walkability score 50, I'm going to select option one because I know I have a walk score 50 plus and I can just go ahead and imp input the walk score here. So if you remember previously, um, you would have to take a screenshot or some download of the walk score and upload. Now it's just a simple enter in the number and then you've completed the specific strategy. That said, um, you're not limited to just this specific option. If you want to go explore the other options, you have the ability to click through um, and note that because you haven't selected it here, it won't allow you to actually um, try to meet any of the requirements. Um, but once I switch, let's say I decide, you know, I'm actually option three, I can select um, option three. And at that point, it will allow me to interact with the different requirements and check off what I need to do. Um, another way to access um, 
these requirements is um, not by selecting this, but you can also um, click the, which is the same position as where um, it is in V2.1. So once I click that, it also brings up the same, um, same drawer here that you can navigate through and check out the different options that you might want to pursue. Another thing that we've also tried to make more clear is the points associated to the strategies. Um, if you remember previously for 2.1, um, depending on if you select yes, NAAC, the point values could differ. Um, we try to always highlight what is the max number of points that you can achieve for a specific, um, for a specific, um, you know, like full credit one, you'll see that you've gotten the, the full credit score. But if you select something like partial credit, um, it will at least let you know you've achieved a partial credit uh, where the full full score is 1.36. So if you're looking for points somewhere or you're trying to figure out, well, how do I improve, improve my score? Um, you also have that to reference. Uh, and then last but not least, as you are um, achieving or, or working through your scorecard, um, you will find that your score is also summarized at the top as you move through uh, the different uh, phases of certification, this will update to show um, you submitted at, whatever score you submitted at, this is your initial review score. So you can always access it up here to see the history. Um, in addition to the certification overview, if you happen to be- Hi, Karen. Karen, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm wondering, could you turn your camera um, off? You're lagging a little see bit. On the... Oh. If you turn your camera off, it might help the connection just a little bit. It's lagging every now and then. Um, let's see if that if that helps at all. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, hopefully that's better. Um, and that actually good timing, Sarah. I think that that is everything I had to to go over on the V three scorecard. So. Perfect. Okay. Well, we have a couple of questions that have come in. So why don't we run through the questions about the, the demo, and then we'll jump into some questions about the, the content itself and, v, and the V3 standard. Um, let me turn my video back on. Um, perfect. So a couple of questions about the tech platform have come in. One is, um, does the new platform show the current status of invoices for projects? For example, whether the client has paid the registration fee or is it still pending? I'm going to try my video. Let me know if it's causing the lag. Um, great question. We don't currently ex have like a concentrated area to sh show the statuses of your invoices. Um, we are working on building that out. Um, currently, though, the way to, to know if you have paid your registration fee or not is if you go to the scorecard and you're prevented from being able to upload your documentation, um, you'll know that the, that's a registration payment issue. And then if um, you do see a banner saying that we're pending certification payment, that's the indication that we're waiting for the certification payment. So for now, that's the only indicator on the platform, um, but we are looking at figuring out how to consolidate uh, the different invoice statuses um, so, so you know for your different projects. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, the next one is, um, how will we know if a criteria requires documentation or just an input? So the introduction of those data inputs, how is are they differentiated from the, from the documentation? Yeah, great question. Um, let me go back into the platform. Um, so depending on the, action, the, the option that you select, so let's do this one for example, you'll see that the only input is um, is compliance documentation. So um, that's all you need to put in. But if I go into a different option, let me see if I can find one. Um, option three, for example, if I'm trying to achieve option three, um, you'll notice that there's a checkbox that requires you to upload a document. So it will tell you exactly what document we're looking for. And then once you upload it, just check off the box saying you, you've uploaded it and then, um, and then you're good. And then the other requirements are listed. Um, so if you remember in 2.1, some of the requirements request multiple different types of documents. Um, we've made it easier to track now what you have and have not uploaded by um, breaking them out into separate kind of checkboxes so that um, as you upload maybe three of, I don't think we have this many requests, but just as an example, if you have uploaded three of 10, you can check off the three that you've uploaded and then know that you have the remaining seven to do. Um, 
PSA two is that um, they don't need to be separate documents. So let's say I do have 10 documents that need to be uploaded. I can put them all in one PDF and upload a single document and then check off the ones that um, are included within that single document. So don't feel like if you've already been grouping documents together into one single PDF or, or whatnot, you can keep doing that. You just need to check off um, the requirements separately. Perfect, thank you. Um, another question is, is the updated platform only available for um, V3 registered projects or will it, um, or will those that are still under V2.1 be on this platform as well? I'll share my understanding, which is that V2.1 um, projects, everyone is on this new platform, but the interface for the V2.1 projects isn't exactly the same. It still um, looks more similar to, to um, the, uh, the legacy version, but Karen, let me know if that's accurate. Sorry, I'm, it's raining here, so I think my internet's a little. Um, I'm just going to repeat because I think you cut out a little bit. Um, from what I heard, yes, you are correct. Um, as long as your project is already on the platform, whatever version you're registered under will continue to work. Um, you'll just be served the relevant view, whether it's 2.1 or 3.0. Um, if you're trying to register new certifications, all those certifications will automatically be put on the V3 scorecard. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, will there be an update to the uploading slash file size limitation? Um, I think this was uh, something that our users um, experienced issues with. It looks um, like not. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, we are we are going to bump up the 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 file size. Um, slightly for for the document size limitations and then and then see how how that goes but um, we do have to limit it given the number of um, the documents that are requested and the number of projects that go through our platform perfect very helpful um so many questions so just want to make sure that we get to a wide um I think this will be the maybe one of the last ones about the um, platform, maybe two more about platform. Um, one is, are you able to show how to pull an invoice for a project in the portal? Karen, is that something that you're able to, to walk you mean the So right now we don't have the ability for, um, for our users to be able to download their own invoices. They'll have to either find that in their, in their email or, um, reach out to the finance team to provide it. Um, but that is something that we want to tackle. Perfect. At some something point. The pipeline. Um, and yeah. then one more thing that I do believe is in our pipeline is um, downloading certificates on the platform once the project is certified. Oh, yes. Um, that is already under development. So you should expect that soon. Hopefully in the next few weeks. But um, I know... Um, we're wrapping up the development on that and um, making sure it's working properly. And then you'll be able to find all of your certificates directly on the platform versus searching and bookmarking it in your uh, in your inboxes. So that is coming soon. Perfect. Thank you so much, Karen. And there are a couple of questions about the platform that we didn't get to, but we will respond um, via email to, to anything that we weren't able to get to during today's session. Um, and then just a couple of questions going back to the uh, content. Um, one really great question that we got around, um, thank you, Oliver, um, for, for noting our passion um, when it comes to um, translating the public health evidence into the standard. It definitely is something we're passionate about. And then the question of, could you please share your thoughts on what you hope the standard would look like for tenants and occupants of the highest performing fit well buildings. Um, I think, why don't we start with Grace for this question? For sure. Um, yeah, so great question. I think uh, obviously we see a, a clear value when the owners and the tenants work together uh, to optimize for health. And I think those highest performing buildings, we would see uh, a benefit, a health benefit across all our seven health impact categories. So we're talking about access to healthy foods, physical activity, uh, infectious disease. I could list them all out, occupant safety. Um, but I think one thing I do want to highlight, uh, especially in light of talking about this V3 update, 
is that uh, in this new update, buildings who certify on this new standard, uh, the highest performing buildings will see benefits in some new areas where we have new strategies. So expanded accessibility. Uh, we've looked at accessibility in terms of economic accessibility, physical accessibility, um, gender accessibility, that's a real highlight. Um, climate change resilience, we've looked at uh, biodiversity. We've also looked at physical climate risk. So uh, flood risk, fire risk, things like that. Um, occupant safety was a real uh, highlight for us. I think we really looked at the research coming out of COVID um, and thought about safety in terms of those workers who couldn't afford to work from home. How can we optimize environments for safety and also contagious disease, obviously integrating our learnings from that time into the holistic standard. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, equity. I think those highest performing buildings will see an enhanced opportunity to really impact equity. I know this is an area of interest, one where research is really trying to uh, quantify that impact. I think it's something we're still uh, it's hard to put a number on, but there are more opportunities in this new standard for those highest performing buildings to impact equity, not only for occupants, but also for the surrounding community. So uh, we're really excited uh, for the enhanced opportunities uh, for health achievement for those highest performing buildings. Awesome. Thank you so much, Grace. Very, very um, thorough kind of vision of what those high performing buildings look like. Um, this one, I'm hoping we can put some users' um, worries at ease here. Um, question around um, if all documents are not ready to submit by the end of 2023, then um, the question is, is V2.1 still applicable? Um, is that something, um, Rachel, that you're able to answer of whether or not users are able to use V2.1, even if they've, so they've purchased it, it's in the platform, they've registered, but their documentation just won't be ready by the end of the year? For V2.1 or for V2.0? For V2.0. Um, oh, the question is um, V2. Yeah, I, I responded to that directly in the, the chat, but for V2.0 projects, they had until the end of the year in 2023 to submit. Um, and so they can upgrade to V3. Um, I believe at no additional cost, they just need to reach out to info at fitwell.org or their relationship manager or ambassadors, if depending on what their relationship is, um, and they can get them, uh, we can help get them moving on, on getting onto V3. Perfect, thank you. So yes, in response to the questions about um, a process to um, move forward between V2.1 and V3, definitely please reach out to our team and we will work with you to get you upgraded into the new standard if that's a path that you want to, to go down. Um, for those who have registered V2.1, um, projects, um, you're good. Um, you can keep using the V2.1 standard. Um, and um, I'm just looking through, we're coming up on time. Um, I note some um, recommendations and requests for um, uh, crosswalks. This is something that um, we will continue to work on and work through over the next several um, months. Um, so please let us know if this is something that is useful for you um, and that can help us um, understand sort of where to put um, in our priorities. So thank you for flagging this. Um, and then the last question that I'm going to answer is, um, can this be made available to single family residential projects? Um, if you could please reach out to me at Sarah at centerforactivedesign.org. Um, this is an area that we are continuing to explore and look into. Right now we have a multifamily residential um, uh, scorecard and, um, we want to sort of explore the opportunity when it comes to opening up for broader residential, um, residential projects. So, um, thank you for this question and please reach out to me again. It's Sarah, S-A-R-A -A, at centerforactivedesign.org. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Rachel to talk a little bit about, um, the, uh, feedback process. So we have been collecting feedback over the past several um, months um, and sort of all throughout the development of the, the V3 standard. But um, as we're in beta phase, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about that process moving forward. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, yeah. So knowing that valuable feedback is, is often shared after launch, um, we when we launched in V3, we opened it to 
Um, when we launched V3 in June, we opened it to a comment period. So we're continuing to accept feedback for V3 um, via the online forms located on the Fitwell Help Center, as well as directly from our users. Um, and this will be happening through the end of the year. Um, so Kenny, I believe, is going to drop the um, V3 Fitwell feedback form directly in the chat. Um, you can share it on one strategy or you can upload you know, an Excel sheet or something if you want to provide it your feedback in bulk. Um, but we know there's a lot to learn about the V3 standard and, and we're committed to getting all the feedback we can so that we can implement those changes in Q1 of 2025 based on the feedback from all of you. So um, again, continuing to collect that feedback via those online forms um, on the Help Center, as well as collecting from the users, our internal team members, those advisory members that we talked about. Um, and we'll be doing that through targeted outreach and other, other forums. And these forums help us to track our feedback so we can prioritize and implement the feedback and have the discussions with our research team. We'll be hosting quarterly calls with our advisories and having ongoing conversations with um, select users to discuss the V3 feedback and content changes. Um, and as we mentioned, you know, Standard works really closely with our research team, among others, to discuss the feedback and content changes. Um, but we'll share quarterly updates with all of our users to communicate the feedback we're receiving and, and give you an update on how we're responding to um, or implementing that feedback. So we will continue to incorporate those minor changes and add additional pathways for strategies at the end of the year after the close of this comment period. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rachel. And also, as you see on your screen or should see on your screen, um, there is a QR code which can help you capture where to submit your V3 feedback in addition to the links that um, that we have shared in the chat. Um, so with that, we always try to end a few minutes before the hour so that everyone can have some time to take a breather, go for a walk, um, always trying to practice what we preach. So um, with that, I do want to close out. Um, I want to thank um, Rachel, Karen, and Grace for sharing their insights today. And really for all of you, for your enthusiasm um, when it comes to fit well, when it comes to promoting health across your portfolios, um, we couldn't do it without you guys. Um, so really welcome all of your feedback. Thank you for being so engaged today. And um, we'll see you next time. Thank you all. Um, there will be a recording. So that should um, hit your inboxes later on. Um, thank you and have a great rest of your week.